We like to begin the main conference. Please have a seat. Now we'd like to introduce the speaker. OECD and Dr. Mark Pearson will be speaking on the title Dignity in Dementia, How Policy Can Improve the Lives of People with Dementia. This is going to be the keynote address. Uh, Dr. Mark Pearson, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, konnichiwa, everybody. Uh, so, distinguished members of the World Dementia Council, Professor Kurokawa, and of course, the guests here today. It's my honor to be able to share with you some of the main messages of our report, which I hope you all have, on how to improve care for people with dementia. And it's been prepared by my colleagues at the OECD, but with close collaboration with our great friends from WHO, for which many thanks. Uh, thank you, Sheka. For while cure must be our long-term goal, we cannot, of course, ignore the needs of the 50 million people globally who have dementia, soon to be rising to 80 million. So what we have in our reports, let me very briefly run through the, the case for policy action. I don't need to persuade, I think, this audience that there is need for action, but maybe it's worth recalling some of the evidence on the size of the problem that we face. This is evidence from the WHO on the global burden of diseases, and dementia is the fastest growing cause of disability in the world today. So the, the uh, diseases towards the top of this chart have the biggest burden of disease, but the ones towards the right-hand side are, the gr are growing more quickly. And so you can see at the moment, dementia is not a huge issue in terms of the, the size of the disability, but it's growing far faster than any of the other sources of disability. And of course, when we look at the over 70s, we find it's already one of the biggest causes of a burden of disease and is growing incredibly rapidly. What that means, of course, when you combine it with population aging, is very large increases in uh, the number of people who will have dementia in coming years. Here I've shown the proportion of the population aged over 80 in different countries. And you can see, even as early as 1990, Japan was actually the youngest uh, OE, uh, G7 country. And yet, by now and in the future, it's the super-aging society where we'll be reaching 14% of the population aged um, over 80. What that means in practice is that we're having a 50% increase in the prevalence of dementia every two decades, an incredibly rapid increase. And that, of course, adds up to money. I'm from an economic organization. Forgive me if I do occasionally mention things like the costs of dementia, because they're very large. What we've done here is to gather together some of the estimates of the direct costs, in other words, the health and long-term care costs uh, due to dementia, together with the indirect costs, people not working either because they have a dementia or because they're caring for somebody with a dementia. And you can see we're talking about very large amounts of money already, even though most of the increase in uh, dementia is still to come. And if we look at the global estimate of the costs of dementia, $650 billion, or if you like, roughly the GDP of Switzerland or of Denmark and Sweden added together, that's already before the big wave of disability due to dementia uh, really starts having an impact. So we have lots of reasons why we must be acting on dementia. The large human cost, of course, is the most important reason, but there is also a very large financial cost that our economies and societies must be coping with. 
So the main focus of our report is what we know about how dementia policy can be improved. And of course, the main responsibility here is that, well, there are good examples of good practice across the world. The real issue, I think, is that good practice is often not replicated widely. We've heard lots of references already to the, the fantastic Dementia Friends initiative that started in Japan and is now spreading across the world. We don't have enough examples like that. Dementia policy is taking place in national silos. And I think one of the, the great uh, successes of this G7, G8 initiative is to spread that conversation globally about how we can learn from each other's practices. And the OECD and the WHO want to work together in order to help you do this. The main focus, of course, is going to be on what happens domestically. We need a cycle of, of testing, evaluating, uh, measuring and benchmarking and implementing policies so that we can learn from what is working. And of course, the renewed focus on research must involve people with dementia and their families uh, much more than has been the case up to now. That's what needs to happen in order for effective policy. But international efforts can actually help you in doing this. We can identify key priority areas, which we've tried to do in this paper, look at the policy options and evidence for what works in each of those areas, and absolutely crucially, try and develop metrics, ways of measuring what different countries are doing and how effective their policies are. And indeed, my biggest hope for this meeting is that we come away with it with an agreement that we must work together to develop international benchmarks for how we're doing on dementia policy, uh, dementia care. I think if we have international agreement on what we should be measuring, then we'll be able to make progress much more rapidly. Now, of course, we're not going to get agreements at this conference, but if we can have or agreements on the measures, but if we can have agreement that we should be working on developing the measures, I think we'll have made a huge step forward. What we do in the paper is identify 10 key objectives for dementia policy. And in each of those areas, we've had a first go at looking at what should be measured. Uh, and those 10 areas, very briefly, I'll run through. Prevention, diagnosis at an appropriate uh, stage. Then for people with early dementia, creating uh, dementia-friendly societies and for supporting informal carers. For people with more advanced dementia, we look at making sure that there is an appropriate care environment, that formal care services uh, are of high quality, and that care for other health needs is done in a satisfactory way. For end-of-life care, we think that we should be looking at whether appropriate care is being provided. And there's some cross-cutting issues, the coordination of care between different providers, and of course, the role of technology. They're the 10 areas where I think we can and should be developing measures of how we're performing in each country in developing good dementia policies. I don't have time, of course, to go through all 10, of those areas. Let me focus very briefly on just four of them. Uh, and the first one is on making sure that we have timely diagnosis. I think the issue here is that obviously people with advanced dementia, we want to make sure have been diagnosed. They'll benefit from, um, there's a good therapeutic case for making sure that we have an appropriate diagnosis. There isn't any good therapeutic case for pre-symptomatic screening as yet. Now this may change if new treatments become available, but we don't want to be running population-based screening on dementia. It would cause more anxiety than, is, uh, than the benefits would justify. So the area that we need to focus on is people with mild symptoms. Are we actually uh, diagnosing them uh, appropriately? I think the evidence 
is pretty strong that if people are concerned about symptoms and seeking a diagnosis, then even a positive result, saying that yes, they do have uh, dementia, is, ca can reduce anxiety, and so the positives outweigh the negatives. And this is broadly reflected in country policies. You know, in, in France, patients are provided with the opportunity for diagnostic te testing, but they do have the right to refuse. Netherlands, again, people entitled to testing, but not actively promoted. If that's the objective, how are we actually doing? And the answer is not particularly well. Uh, fewer than half of all people with dementia in England have a diagnosis. When we look in Germany, we find that that's a similar ratio. Only 44% of care home residents with dementia, um, there's 44% of them have no diagnosis. So I think that we're a long way from where we need to be in ensuring that people with dementia are diagnosed appropriately. And we do know that policy can make a big difference here. If you look at what's been happening in Scotland, for example, where they went from a very low rate of just 40% of people with dementia being diagnosed, right up to 67% now in the matter of just four or five years. That's a very impressive achievement. So I think there, there are clear metrics that we can be developing that we can use to check how we are doing across countries and whether we are performing as well as the people with the good practice, the best practice. Second area I want to look at is supporting informal carers. And you know, most countries have been moving towards more community care not necessarily particularly rapidly. I, the little black dots here are the number of people who are living in the community and yet receiving care uh, in the year 2000, whereas the bars show the current state or the state in 2012. And there's been an increase in most countries in line with national policies. But it's not been particularly rapid. Of course, the reason why we promote this is that we believe it can lead to a better quality of life if people are cared for at home, and possibly also it may be cheaper uh, to do so. When we actually look at the policies that are in place to support uh, informal carers, we do find, again, a lot of problems and a lot of things that maybe we should be measuring more to understand how well we are doing. For example, respite care is increasingly provided to support informal carers. But when we actually look at how it's used, we find that many people do not take advantage of this care for various reasons. But nevertheless, I think that's a very good case for why we should be measuring this more carefully and understanding what, what are the reasons why people aren't using the services available to them. Counselling and support, of course, uh, is very important, and I, I'd like to draw attention, as we do in the report, to the, the English Dementia Carers Support Service, which links current carers with former carers, I think a very valuable initiative. Uh, help with people who are in employment. Of course, if you have to care for an elderly relative and you have a job, that's a problem, or it certainly can be a problem. I think Germany has been very innovative here with its policy to allow you to reduce hours but to maintain your salary in return for in the future um, having a lower hourly salary rate but working uh, for longer in order to be able to buy some time so that you can actually support a family member. And information and training of course is very very important uh, and draw attention in our reports to the, uh, the policy in France to in allow people who have dementia caring responsibilities two days of training per year. So I think there's a lot going on in informal care that again we can be measuring and looking to see what works. Third area I want to draw attention to and a particular uh, topic which is I think concerns me very much is how we manage uh, people with dementia when they have other health needs. People with dementia are two to three times more likely to be admitted to a hospital. When they get there, they stay on average twice as long as people without dementia. 
they're more likely to be readmitted quickly to hospital. They cost, as a result of those two factors, nearly three times as much for the same diagnosis as somebody uh, without dementia. And yet when we look at what happens to people with dementia in hospital, we find some horrifying statistics, 15 to 30 percent developing some delirium, uh, third, losing functional ability whilst they're in hospital. And these things persist, uh, even after six months or even uh, beyond that. People's uh, poor functional ability and delirium is not recovering. Uh, so hospital care, we can't help but conclude, is poor for people with dementia at present. There are initiatives going on, which I think we, again, uh, can be learning from information sharing, uh, consistent recording of diagnoses across different parts of the care system, consultation and liaison services in order to provide uh, t um, appropriate care, reduce the risk of depression for people with uh, a dementia, and specialist wards, uh, which I think have been having um, some positive outcomes so far as we can tell from the evaluations. There are examples of good practice. I mean, I'd, I'd like again to draw attention to the, the great example of, in Ontario of, of geriatric emergency and management nurses in hospital emergency departments to identify, assess and work with people, uh, with frail elderly people. I think that's a fantastic initiative. And what's happening in the UK to develop dementia care pathways uh, and having three quarters of UK hospitals now having dementia champions. So again, I think there are some interesting initiatives going on that we must evaluate and if they work, spread more widely across the world. Last area I want to talk about, of course, how could I not in Japan talk about the role of technology for improving care for people with dementia. Lots of promising examples uh, of how technology can improve dementia care. But we have to face the fact that it's not yet very widely used. I mean, we have some great examples of promoting social interaction. Everybody knows about the para robot. Uh, and that is now, of course, being subject to a randomized clinical trial in the Netherlands. Automatic dispensers to reduce medication error. Um, Tele-support monitoring services such as the comfort zone in uh, the United States to cope with wandering issues. Uh, and mechanical lifting devices to reduce the risk of, in of injury. Lots of initiatives going on, but they're not really being widely used. Now, why is that? I think there's three key barriers to the development of care technologies. The first is the type of technologies that are being developed. Uh, we don't really get as much user-focused development as we should. I think some of these technologies are designed for technology companies, not for people with dementia. And I think we need to find ways to get the needs of people with dementias uh, much more involved in the development process. But more than that, I think we need to evaluate the effectiveness of new technologies much more effectively than we currently do. There are not enough robust trials of new technologies going on, not in the way that we do for new pharmacological products, for example. Uh, and this will give the confidence for care systems to actually use new technologies more widely. But this third issue about clear reimbursement criteria, I think, is also very important. Most care systems do not have clear, transparent criteria for how they will actually pay for new technologies. So why should they be developed? Uh, I think this, we need to find a way of giving manufacturers the confidence that new technologies will be actually bought by, uh, by caring uh, institutions and that means that we must have much more clear reimbursement criteria. Ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking about the need for measuring in performance, and I'm going to actually re say this yet again. I, the improving the measurements of dementia needs to be a priority 
in any international efforts. We have very few internationally comparable measures of dementia outcomes and the impacts of policy. We need to do that much, much better than we currently do. And I hope that this event provides an opportunity to continue that conversation even more. I was very encouraged yesterday by the number of questions that we actually got from the floor about when people talked about their new care models, people asking, what were the evaluations? Can you actually demonstrate that this was effective and cost effective? I think that they are the right questions to be asking and we must build a system internationally to make sure that we can answer those questions better than we currently do. There are some key enablers to make, uh, make sure that we do that better, improving diagnosis rates, consistent identification and coding of dementia in health facilities, possibly even dementia registers, have, as already happens in, in Sweden. Or if not, then we make sure that we can link data across health and care systems using electronic health records. In terms of the actual measures, we've made some suggestions in our paper, the, the measures that we would think are possible over the next five, ten years to develop uh, internationally comparable uh, indicators across countries. Uh, obviously, that's to start the conversation. We expect uh, much more work, much more consultations on how we can refine this list and build consensus internationally over the coming years. So let me conclude. We need an international framework for understanding performance and holding each other to account for the improvements that we can make in dementia care. We've argued that there are four key elements that will enable this to happen, that we have to agree a set of objectives for dementia policy against which we can be assessed, that we develop evidence on which policy approaches uh, work and indeed what is going on across countries, that we develop international metrics to measure overall performance so that we can say where countries are doing well and doing badly in their dementia care and develop these enablers for measurements such as electronic health records. So we need to start, uh, we need much more work that we know on how to develop this framework. We look forward to working with the WHO ready for the, the March uh, events, the final legacy events uh, of the World Dementia Council and we need to start a conversation there so that at that event I hope we can start coming to agreements about what can be achieved internationally. I thank you for your attention. Thank you.